Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I suppose I can start. Um, let me just go to the next slide, and I can start talking about myself for just a few seconds. So my name is uh, Ish Sukan. I uh, work for a company called La Sentinelle Limited, which is in Mauritius, and I work more specifically in the LSL Digital Division. And I'm also an Open Suisse member. So very briefly, what we do. Uh, La Sentinelle uh, is a media company that publishes newspapers, magazines, manuals, and uh, school textbooks, for not just for Mauritius, but Madagascar and a couple of other countries in the African continent. And then my division, LSL Digital, that's mainly what we do. We do advertising, video production, software development, manage services for the company, and we do have a couple few external customers. And we also do training. It's not an exhaustive list, but that's it, a little bit. So again, very quickly, my journey with OpenSUSE started a couple of years ago. Well, to be precise, somewhere around 2009 uh, with the OpenSUSE Ambassadors program. I've been uh, talking every now and then, but mostly only in Mauritius. And this is my first time at OSC. My first time in Nuremberg, my first time in Germany, and my first time in Europe. So please, be gentle, be kind. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to talk about is OpenSUSE Micro OS. And most of the time, this is the question that pops when I tell people that I'm using Micro OS in production. So why Micro OS? Uh, the next few things uh, might be a repetition of what others have already spoken about, as in advantages of micro OS. Uh, may maybe this line is not correct. I should have said uh, micro OS, the container host, because micro OS, the way uh, Richard has been presenting uh, in the presentation earlier, it's not just for containers. He's aiming for desktops. So yeah, uh, the container host, first of all, it's designed for containers. So what can I do with that? Obviously, something like this. Right from the moment of install right from the moment after installation, I can already start managing containers. I can create my containers, I can deploy my applications, and that's it. I do not have to go around installing a couple of tools to be able to start uh, uh, deploying. Next. Uh, it's lightweight. It doesn't come with unneeded packages. For example, if I would take uh, a generic Linux distribution for a server, and I would like to, do, to run containers on those, yes, I would install a container engine and do that. But at the same time, I would get tons of packages which I don't need. And uh, it will be a pain to remove those packages. So yeah. And next, transactional updates, which Richard and others have, uh, I suppose, have already spoken about. If something is messed up with an update, you just roll back. So I really like that. Uh, the last one is it's based on Tumbleweed. So you're always on cutting edge. So how to obtain micro OS? Until a few weeks ago, this was how you would get it. You would go on uh, cubic.opensuse.org. And uh, you would download the installation media. And during installation, you're going to select the OpenSUSE Micro OS system role. But like I said, that was until a few weeks ago. Now it's no more. So now uh, we do not have a fancy page right now where you could just go and download the, uh, the installation media. But at least for me, this is what I do. I go to mirrors.opensuse.org, find the closest mirror, because I leave in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Mauritius, everything is far away from us. Europe is far, US is far, Australia is far, and the closest that I get could be uh, South Africa with 75 milliseconds of you know, downloading things. So yes, I will find it, and I will go under the tumbleweed uh, uh, URL there, and I will find the OpenSUSE micro DVD ISO image. All right? We have our image. We put it on pen drive, or maybe we're going to try it on a VM. And this is what is going to happen. You get this uh, until this step of the installation, where you need to select a system role. And you're going to select micro OS container host. Because if you select the first one, 
it's not for containers. It's like uh, you just have the micro OS and you do whatever you want with that. We have a very stripped down version of, uh, of OpenSUSE, Dumbleweed. So the next thing, this is not about micro OS, but I have the micro OS container host running. Now I need to create my containers. So this is what I'm using on my machine and build up. So, uh, sorry, I think I messed up, yeah. So uh, with Builder, the first thing that I'm going to do is run this thing, which is just three words, Builder from OpenSUSE. And uh, by doing this, I get uh, a working container into which I can uh, package my application. Uh, let's say that's, that could be just a, a binary from a Go application that my uh, developers just wrote. And the next step would be like this. I do build images, and I could see that uh, OpenSUSE working container is running. And next, like I said, uh, in this slide, you can, I would just give you a quick uh, explanation of that. LSL-app is actually a folder that contains uh, my application files, a binary, a couple of images, most probably, a configuration file, something like a .env with environment variables for my program. And all I would do is copy all these into that working container. All right? The next thing that I need is an entry point. So like you would know that when you have a container, when you spin the container and make it run uh, using any container engine, the first thing that is going to run is what has been spe specified at the entry point. Otherwise, you could still run your container and specify what you're going to run. In this case, I'm specifying that in the folder called app, there's a script called entry point. And within that script, I'm going to obviously say, OK, you know, there's this binary here. You can run it. But before running this, there's a couple of few things that you need to do in this container. So all right, that's it for creating my container uh, with, a, let's say, an application that my developers have developed. Now, after doing the, those first two steps, there's one last thing that I need to do. I need to commit this. And as you can see, it's very simple. Build a commit, open CZ working container, and I'm going to give it a name and a tag. So this application uh, has been developed uh, by uh, La Sentinelle, by my, my developer colleagues, as a microservice for a single sign-on service. That is, we have different tools, and this one is going to be the single sign-on where uh, employees just come in, sign in, and they can make requests for transport, make requests to HR, make requests for maybe the canteen, something like that. Uh, and we call it Passport. So that is why in the name there. All right. Now, actually, what I was showing you earlier, I think I messed up with uh, these slides. The first tool I was talking about was Builder, and the second tool which is present in the micro OS container host is Podman. But again, last minute slides, you know, it's, it happens to be messed up. So after I've used Builder to, to create the container and put uh, the application in that, I do Podman images, just like you would use another container engine and uh, maybe you do Docker images, you usually find your images. But on images, the same. Um, you will see that the repository on this, uh, and this one is localhost passport because I'm still creating that in my machine. I haven't published it on a uh, repository somewhere. It's uh, just for tests. So now that I have my image, my image available here, my next step is to just run it and test it. So very simple. These are the same uh, options, flags, the way you want to call it, that you might have been using with Docker, like Docker run, blah, 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 and it happens. So the same applies to Podman. So I have Podman run. I'm running that in detached mode. I'm exposing the, the port. My application in the container runs and, uh, over port uh, 7004, mapping that with 8080 on my uh, host machine. I'm giving the container a name called Passport, and obviously the last part of that is telling which container to run, and I'm putting the tag version 1. Notice that I haven't specified a command after that, because I already have an entry point, which was the entry point.sh script, in which 
I'm telling the container, when you're spinning, you just have to run uh, the binary. So that's it. Oh, yeah. There's a second way to do it. Uh, in the previous slide, I said, OK, I'm just mapping the port. Or you could specify a, a, how do you call that? A fixed IP address if you're just testing that. So it's dash dash IP, and you, you specify it, and it's going to work uh, almost the same. All right, I do a Podman PS this time, and uh, my container passport uh, with the tag v1 is running. And in the command, you might see that it's been sh slash app slash e for the entry point and it goes on there. Uh, actually, this uh, particular application also needs uh, Postgres and Redis, and that's something that I had already run on the machine. And to finish, I just have to put the localhost 8080 there, and it's working. So uh, I don't know about, uh, OK. I will try to do this here. It's a bit not something that I had planned. Oh, it's not working. But anyway, let's do it like this. I have to look at two screens at the same time. But one PS, like I said, uh, so this one is where I've mapped the port, uh, as you can see in the last, last row there. It's mapping uh, my host system's 8080 over container 7204. So if this time I have to, all right, I have to do it like this. OK, my, never mind. Never mind. Let's go until the last slide, maybe. All right. Yeah, this one. And here it is. So anyone has a question about this, of why we are doing it, and uh, anything specific to Podman Builder or MicroS in general? Sorry, I was trying to, do, to, to just run the same thing again in the terminal, but uh, uh, the mirroring of the laptop is not working. So anyone, comments, questions possibly? No one. That's cool. Awesome. Ah, you have something. OK. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, is there a way for you to, to run multiple containers at the same time with Podman or in microOS? I mean, you, you've shown that you're using Postgres and Redis as well. If you want to deploy all them at the same time in a coordinate fashion? I don't think I got your question clear. Uh, I mean, is there yeah. Is there for you a way to, to reproduce the, the behavior of uh, Docker Compose, for example? Uh, Docker Compose, for example. So um, not exactly that way, but uh, you could still write everything in a Docker file. OK, Richard, is, I think Richard wants to answer that. So I was about to talk about Podman build or so, build yeah. build, but anyway. You could do fancy stuff with Podman build. But one of the really cool features that I forgot to talk about in my talk, um, Podman supports pods. So in Kubernetes land, when you've got a, a service where you need to have more than one container, you know, in Docker land, you use Docker Compose, you put it in a one YAML file. In Kubernetes land, you put them in a, another different kind of YAML file for pod. Podman supports that. So use, pod, yeah, use pods instead of, contain, uh, instead of Compose, you're done. It's easy. You don't have to use Kubernetes, so you can yeah, so you can use Podman with pods without Kubernetes, and then if you grow into Kubernetes and then it ends, it's it's even more efficient than using Docker Compose. So. Yes, he Richard already explained that. You could still use Podman to create your pods and uh, when you're running each of those containers, you could just 
uh, put, just like in the previous slides, I've put, uh, uh, where is it? I think it was in this one, dash dash IP address to specify the ad, uh, IP. I would just have to put dash dash uh, pod to put the pod name that I created, and all those containers that I'm spinning will go in a specific pod. And that's very simple. If those uh, different, then in this case, in this particular case, exactly, uh, the application, the Go application on the first line, uh, the Redis and the Postgres would all communicate over once 27001 because they are on the same pod, so sharing the same uh, network namespace. And then, of course, you can have a second pod. We have a tons of applications, and all those will be communicating over that loopback interface and not communicating. Uh, th there won't be the communication between the two pods. Yeah. Uh, somebody else? Comment, question, maybe? All right, cool. That was a short and sweet presentation. Thank you, people.